As many of you know, I am Dr. Jennifer Lancaster. I am the Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I welcome you to our colloquia today where we uh, allow our faculty members and engage them in discussing their newest works. Um, I would like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Geelan, who we will hear from later. I know that the program says that it was him and I, but really it was just him. Um, so he really deserves the, all the credit. Um, and I hope this will be the first in many events that will celebrate the faculty that we have here. So thank you, Dr. Geelan. So with your permission, authors, I will go in the relative order of the program, um, introduce you and then have you come up. I understand that they have between seven and 10 minutes. So I'll give you a little high sign uh, when we get close so we keep on schedule and we have time to uh, discuss out there in the, in the vestibule. So our first author is Rita Baron Faust. She is an adjunct professor at St. Francis who earned her master's degree in public health from Hunter College uh, at the City University of New York uh, in urban public health and community health education and a certification as a certified health education specialist from the National Commission for Health Credentialing. She is a longstanding member of many professional writers organizations and serves on the board of Science Writers in New York. In her own words, Rita says, I've been fortunate to be able to combine my passion for writing with my passion for medicine as a journalist in every medium from wire services to the web. To discuss her new book, The Autoimmune Connection, Essential Information for Women on Diagnosis, Treatment, and Getting On With Your Life, please welcome Rita Baron Faust. It surprised me that I go first. I was always in the A and B homeroom. But um, this book is kind of interesting. I stumbled on the subject. I knew nothing about autoimmune disease. I, I've written six books on women's health. I was at a, a women's health meeting, and there was someone speaking on this topic, and she was telling me how women are not taken seriously when they describe symptoms of a serious disease. So of course I had to know about it. And that's one of the reasons it took me about, oh my God, almost 10 years to research it from the time I first heard about it because there wasn't a lot of information out there. Um, and it's been very satisfying because I work with the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association as an educator. And it's, it's amazing when people come up to me and say, your book is my Bible. I'm always startled. Um, it encompasses the diseases more common in women. But there are some rare ones that even I've never heard about. I met someone this week on an autoimmune walk who had something I absolutely had never heard of. But this book is designed to make sense of vague symptoms. You know, you go into the doctor's office, he says, how are you feeling? And you go, I've had a pain here. I've had a headache. You give a list, a laundry list of vague symptoms and the doctor's eyes glaze over. And a lot of these diseases have very vague symptoms that come and go. And when women relate them to their doctors, they go, oh, that's just aging. Oh, that's just menopause. Um, it's just a, quote, female complaint. And a lot of these diseases actually do play havoc with a woman's reproductive system. So part of this effort like my other books, was to get women taken seriously in the doctor's office, especially for these diseases, which a lot of people are not familiar with. Um, trying to think of something in here. I've, I don't usually talk about the book. I usually talk about the subject matter. Um, but it took the publisher 10 years to be convinced to update it. And it took about four years to update it because everything is new. Um, the difference is that I had a ton of paper files the first time. Now I have PDFs. I'm the queen of PDFs. 
But this book, doctors have told me they keep it in their office as a reference. And that, to me, is incredibly satisfying because I'm kind of an MD wannabe. You know, I watch all the medical shows on TV, and uh, I could only do that. So to hear physicians tell me, and nurses too, that they use this in, in their practice is really very satisfying. And I'm working on a new book. It's going to be aimed at people like myself who have learning disabilities that nobody knows about. How many of you have ever heard of dyscalculia? That's two. There are lots of people like this out there. We're numbers blind, so my, my next book is going to be designed not just to help women, but to help people who are struggling with this from college on. We think about helping children, but we don't think about helping adults. And it's a very tough thing to be able to deal with all the time. So um, this, there's information out there. You can go through a book and find help. Um, it's harder to find out, find help for something that you really struggle with mentally every day. So that's my next project. And I'll take questions later. Thank you. Our next presenter is Marissa Cohen. Marissa is a, an associate professor in the psychology department and co-founder of the Self-Awareness and Bonding Lab which is a relationship science lab. She obtained a PhD in educational psychology with a concentration in learning, development, and instruction from the CUNY Graduate Center, and then took a 90 degree turn, uh, <clears throat> and currently has two lines of research focusing on first date experiences and consensually non-monogamous relationships. Dr. Cohen is the author of From First Kiss to Forever, A Scientific Approach to Love, which relates relationship science research to everyday experiences. Please welcome Dr. Cohen. This is my book, From First Kiss to Forever, A Scientific Approach to Love. Um, I would like to thank the psychology department. Many members are here today, and especially the co-founder of the lab, Dr. Karen Wilson, because a lot of the research that uh, we conducted in the lab was kind of what inspired me to write this book. So um, I write for Science of Relationships, which is a website that tries to distill important research in the area of relationship science, as well as Psychology Today, and my blog is Finding Love, the Scientific Take. So these are a series of, this book consists of a series of different articles that I've written for both of those websites. So just to kind of give you a sense of what the book is actually about, it takes a look at relationship science, which is a field which is only about 35 years old. It's an interdisciplinary field which draws from psychology, sociology, biology, anthropology, philosophy, and um, a lot of pop psychology articles are really focusing on this area now. So my goal was to be able to take an academic look in a way that I could present it to just the general public. I wanted to discuss some of the important, the important research in the field as well as provide take home tips, questions that people can ask themselves so they can actually apply the principles to their everyday lives. So just to kind of give you a sense, um, I start with relationships basically from conception to death. The, this is pretty much my table of contents and the way I broke it up. Um, I cover things such as famous studies looking at how you can actually generate interpersonal closeness in a matter of an hour with another person. I look at online dating algorithms and how that actually can help you find love. Um, I look at the idea of Barry Schwartz's paradox of choice, which is something that's currently plaguing people that are online dating. The idea that when you have too much choice, it's kind of hard to settle on one and you know, whittle down your options and stay in a stable relationship. Um, I look at things like neotenous features or baby-like features, which brings out our natural caregiving instinct to want to take care of and bond to other individuals. 
I look at the difference between the sexes or sometimes a lack of difference between the sexes and how courtship has changed and also how courtship a lot of times largely remains the same where we tend to fall back into very gender stereotypical roles while dating. Um, I talk a lot about misattribution in paradise, which I will uh, mention in a moment, which has to do with misattribution of arousal. Um, I try to touch on relationships that people think they know about, as well as relationships that are underrepresented in the research. So I spend a great deal of time in these chapters discussing consensual non-monogamy, which uh, approximately 4% of people are in consensually non-monogamous relationships, though this is probably largely underreported. Um, I also talk about the end of relationships, specifically John Gottman's uh, Four Horsemen of the Dating Apocalypse. And John Gottman is an amazing researcher who was actually able to predict divorce with over 90% accuracy. And uh, for those of you in the social science, we know it is really, really challenging to be able to predict anything with that degree of accuracy. And the great thing about this is just by understanding what the four horsemen are and how you might be employing them within your relationships, friendships, romantic relationships, we can start to think about ways that we can enhance our relationships and avoid employing these when we're arguing with, with others. So I figured that the best way to kind of let you know what the book was about was to touch on two short topics in a very short period of time. Um, and discuss two of my favorite factors of interpersonal attraction. And when I say attraction here, I don't mean uh, physical attraction. I mean the type of attraction that makes you want to get to know another individual, to bond with them, and potentially form a long-term relationship with them. The first is propinquity. Propinquity is my favorite to discuss because it's like your SAT word of the day. And propinquity actually means nearness in physical space. One of the questions that I get from people is, well, now that we have online dating and social media, is there really this need for propinquity? But research has shown that the first thing that people do when they get onto an online dating site is they filter within five miles or 10 miles of their zip code. There are people who will consider taking the train to Queens, a long distance relationship, if they live in Manhattan. So in fact, we are looking for people who are close to us, which from an evolutionary standpoint makes sense. It's access to them. So a really great study, which was done post-World War II by Leon Festinger, for the psych people here, we know Leon Festinger. This is one of the studies that we don't talk about. We kind of focus on his cognitive dissonance, but important nonetheless. Um, where he was examining housing patterns at MIT, and he was looking at couples, married couples who had moved in post-World War, World War II, and they were randomly assigned to 17 two-story buildings, 10 apartments per building arranged in four quads. And he asked them two questions. He asked them, uh, who are your closest friends, and how many friends do you have overall and along that line, anticipate how many friends you think everyone else in your building has, which is a measure of like popularity index. And what he found was people who were discussing their closest friends were those who were either next door or two doors down from them. So those who were propinquity prevailed. And he found out that the people who wound up having the most friends as rated by both themselves and others were the people who were near the mailboxes and near the staircases. So if you think about it, and this leads to another factor, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but it's in the book, uh, mere exposure effect, those who are by the staircases and those who were uh, by the mailboxes, people are constantly passing them. So they see them over and over and over again, and it's kind of like when you hear that song in the beginning of the summer, like that sum the big summer song, where over time it starts to get kind of caught in your head, that was pretty much happening here. The poor people in Building 17 had the fewest friends, and when it was investigated who those people in Building 17 were, it wasn't about the people, but Building 17 was the only building that opened out to the back parking lot. So in order to get there, people had to walk the long way around to walk into their building, and they never interacted with other people. The last thing that I just want to say is another factor, and this is affective state, and um, one of my chapters deals specifically with this. And this is the idea that basically we understand or we interpret what's going on a lot from our physiological cues. 
So if your stomach's kind of rumbling, you might think you're nervous because that's something that happens um, a lot of times when we are nervous. And this is a famous Dutton and Aaron Bridge study in 1974. And it has to do with misattribution of arousal. And just to tell you really quickly, um, they had female Confederates on one of two bridges. They had a very high bridge, shaky, off the ground, swaying back and forth in the wind uh, over like gorges in a waterfall. So it gets that, you know, physiological arousal level pretty up high. And they had another bridge, which was very low, sturdy to the ground. And the female Confederates would stand there until a male would pass them. When the male would come by, she would give them a survey, and then when he finished it, she would hand him her phone number. And she would say, please call me if you have any questions about this study. What the researchers actually found is that a statistically significantly greater amount of people called the woman who was on the high shaky bridge, and not only that, wound up asking her out on a date the next day. So what's actually happening here is people are getting off the bridge, their heart is pumping, they're breathing more rapidly, they're shaking, and they're like, it must have been love. And they're misattributing it to this experience with this woman and in fact actually wound up calling her and asking her out on a date. Studies with couples have shown that those who engage in some sort of cardiovascular activity versus something more like yoga or meditation actually will report greater relationship satisfaction post their workout. So for those of you who are looking to have an exciting night out, go for a hike, jump on a treadmill, find a scary bridge. Um, and um, this is my book, which is available. It's here on Open Books, which is my publisher, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And like I pretty much said, and you saw from the table of contents, I cover things like good dates, bad dates, and a lot of original research uh, that we published. I tried to distill my academic research for a popular audience. Um, I actually spend several chapters talking about Bachelor in Paradise. And I know you're probably thinking, like, how in any way can I make this academic? In fact, they actually employ a lot of principles of relationship science to their show. Um, so that is covered. Uh, I talk about the data. I talk about some of the most heartbreaking breakups in history and potentially why it went wrong. And I, I, think, I, I think I kind of was able to unpack this a little bit. And, you know, um, and basically just love. So that's pretty much it. Next up is Dr. Peter Leibman. Dr. Leibman is an associate professor in the education department and a graduate of St. Francis College. Pete has more than 40 years experience in secondary and post-secondary education and administration. In addition, he is the co-recipient of a New York City Troops to Teachers grant, which focuses on helping veterans prepare to enter the classroom. That seems only fitting, given his new book, Launch a Teaching Career, Secrets for Aspiring Teachers. Please welcome Dr. Pete Leibman. As I was saying, in 1974, Bob hired me to be the administrator, uh, assistant principal at Bishop Lachlan. And that started the friendship for about 40 years. And then, uh, when he became chair at uh, St. Francis for the education department, he was the one who hired me to be an associate professor in the education department. Those were the two best jobs I ever had. And unfortunately, Bob passed away about a year and a half ago. But he was undoubtedly the best administrator I ever had the opportunity to work with. The other person I'd like to thank is Dr. Macurola. I had no idea how ill Frank was. And I asked him to do the forward for my book. And without hesitation, he agreed. Um, he got me the forward a short time before he passed away, and that meant a great deal to me. So, those two people stand out in my mind as two mentors. They were always there for me, and I appreciated their support all throughout my career. What I'd like to do is speak to why now is the perfect time to get a teaching job, where those jobs are, the impetus for the book, and then I'm going to finish with a story. First, why is this the best time to get a teaching job? Well, for starters, there are four million teachers in this country. Over two million are baby boomers getting ready to retire. So all of the disciplines, uh, there are teachers needed in every discipline, is the teacher shortage. Another factor is immigration. 
you would think that after 9-11, we would have had more scrutiny with people coming into the country, but just the opposite is true. We take in a million immigrants every year. In 2014, for example, 95 unaccompanied minors crossed our southern border. They were dispersed all over the country. 7,500 were dispersed on Long Island, where I live. What are the ramifications for teachers? Well, ESL programs need teachers, bilingual ed, foreign language, English teachers. Another factor is autism. I remember a time when one in 250 students would be diagnosed with autism. Now it's one in 68. Five years ago when there was a teacher shortage, or I should say a hiring freeze in uh, New York, there was no hiring freeze for special ed. We get calls weekly in the education department for special ed teachers. Another factor has to do with social issues. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are rapidly becoming a fatherless society. 40% of all children in our country are born out of wedlock. In some of our communities, 73% are born out of wedlock. What are the ramifications for teachers? Well, there was a time when if you wanted a guidance counseling job in a school, you weren't going to get it. In the last four or five years, six of our students have gone through the counseling program at Alfred University. They all had jobs when they completed the program. School psychologists, social workers, uh, before and after school supervisors, and now we have universal pre-K uh, in New York, so we need teachers to fill those spots. Where are the jobs? The six-pack is what they're referred to when they talk about where the states are that have most of the jobs. There are six states that have 80% of the teaching jobs. New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, California, Texas, and Florida. The two states that have the most positions are California and New York. In New York, where we are, this is the largest school district in the world, 1,400 schools. In addition, when you attach charter schools and private schools, we're looking at 2,500 schools. So there are an incredible number of opportunities for students who want to get into education. Why then is it so difficult for somebody to get the teaching job of their choice? When I started working at St. Francis 11 years ago, I um, also became moderator of Kappa Delta Pi International Education Honor Society. And my first presentation was at St. Mary's College in upstate New York. There were eight professors uh, who were going to present. The planners of the conference put us in eight different classrooms. There were about 100 students in attendance. When I got to the classroom, I had an overflow crowd. Trust me, it wasn't because of me. It was because of the topic. How do you get a teaching job? Nobody knew. There are plenty of, uh, of colleges out there that are very good at training students to be teachers, but nobody focuses on how you get the teaching job. That's the big issue. So it became apparent to me when they moved me to the cafeteria to accommodate the crowd that students were going to have a lot of questions about how you get the teaching job. While the other professors who had presented were on their way home, I was answering questions for about three hours. That led to other presentations that I gave for Kappa Delta Pi at various colleges across the country. It was always the same. Nobody knew how to get that job. They knew how to teach, but they really didn't know how to market themselves. Then in 2012, I was invited to speak at St. John's University. And at one of the breaks in the cafeteria, I was standing in a circle with about six or seven professors. And one of the professors pointed over at 30 students over in the corner, and he said, gee, why would anybody want to become a teacher now? Another professor said, yeah, we haven't placed a student in a full-time job in two and a half years. All of the professors nodded in agreement. Then one of them turned to me and said, so Pete, what do you think? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I think this is a perfect time for somebody to get into teaching. Our students at St. Francis College are getting jobs in record numbers. 
After a few moments of awkward silence, Mr. Two and a Half Years turned to me and he said, well, why don't you write a book? <laughs> and I decided to do just that. What I'd like to do now is share a, a story with you. My students tell me all the time that I have a thousand stories, something for every concept, and I do. When you've been teaching and being in education for 47 years, you're going to accumulate a lot of experience. This is the conclusion of my book, and I'd like to share it with you. I hope it resonates with you. The story goes something like this. In 1975, I was a rookie assistant principal at Bishop Lachlan High School in Brooklyn. It was the day before Thanksgiving, about 4.30 in the afternoon. As far as I knew, everybody had left the building. And my last task each day was to go through the building to make sure that nobody was lurking in the shadows. My tours the previous three months had been uneventful, but that was about to change. I took the elevator to the fourth floor, made a sharp left turn into the main corridor, and immediately I heard and saw something at the end of the hall. As I got closer, my eyes narrowed, and I could see that someone was seated in the hall, back up against the locker, legs out into the corridor. And as I got even closer, I could see that he was crying. His shoulders were move, moving up and down violently as he cried. I knelt down, put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, and he looked up, and I could see that it was Junior Brian Johnson. I said, Brian, no matter what happened, it isn't, is it, it isn't anything we can't fix. And I encouraged him to come down to my office where, after about an hour, I had the whole story. Basically, what happened was, he was called upon to read in class earlier that day. And he wasn't a very good reader. He started to stumble over even the simplest words. And the students started to make fun of him and mimic him. The teacher, not known for his sensitivity, said, What's the matter with you, Brian? Can't you read? Somebody else take over for him. Brian cut all of his remaining classes and went home. And when he got home, he found his father waiting for him with Brian's report card in one hand and his belt in the other. And as he beat the boy, he said over and over, I have a stupid son. I have a stupid son. The lessons of that day weren't lost on me. There are four. First of all, what we had here was a conspiracy against this young man. He was told by his classmates, his teacher, and his own father that he couldn't be successful academically. Because he heard it from so many different sources, he believed their words. As a result, he never worked on his challenges. And as a result of that, he never improved. And that just reaffirmed what everybody was saying about him all along. So lesson number one is never ever be part of the conspiracy. Number two. People do pretty much what we expect them to do. Set the bar high and you'll be amazed at what your students can achieve. Lesson number three, don't focus on the infraction. Look at the reason behind the infraction. And lesson number four, and most important, mediocre teachers are surrounded by mirrors. It's all about them. They are the center of the universe. They focus on what they teach not what students learn. The problem with being surrounded by mirrors is that your own reflection obscures the view. You never get to see your students as they really are with all of their strengths and challenges. If you really want to be a master teacher, those mirrors have to dissolve and then something magical happens. You see your students as they really are with all of their strengths and challenges and then and only then are you able to produce lessons that overcome the challenges and enhance the positives. Over the next year and a half after I found Brian, I set up a building service team to give him the help that he needed and we got him through. Okay, fast forward about 35 years. I go back to the school for an alumni reunion. I'm online for dinner. Actually, it was my third place, um, my third portion of Swedish meatballs. And somebody comes up and touches my shoulder and I turn to see Brian. And he says, Dr. Leibman, it's great to see you. I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Cheryl. She's the second person who believed in me. His eyes welled, she held him close, and I have to tell you, my professional life flashed before me. 
Brian went on to explain that he and Cheryl have been happily married for 25 years, have a very successful business, and have three beautiful children. Hey, Dr. Leibman, I tell them each day how much I love them. Later, when I got up to leave, Brian took me aside and he said, you know, Dr. Leibman, you changed my life forever and I'll never forget you. Funny, when I told him that he had changed my life so much more, I could tell by the wonder in his eyes that he really didn't understand what I meant. Mark Van Doren, the great educator from Columbia, taught there for about 40 years, once said that every time he got to his classroom door, every time he took the doorknob in his hand, he always paused because he felt he was about to step on sacred ground. Now, there was a man who truly understood the incredible opportunity and responsibility we all have as teachers. William Barclay once said that the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you were born, and number two, the day you discover why. Folks, I have to tell you, I discover why every single time I walk into my own classroom here at St. Francis. My personal hope for everybody here, regardless of your profession, is that you get the opportunity again and again to experience the magic that comes with making a difference in someone else's life. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Gregory Tay. Dr. Tagg is a professor in the English department at St. Francis College and co-founder of the Evolutionary Studies Collaborative with some of our fellow St. Francis College faculty. He has been a contributor, contributor to Origins of English Literary Modernism and Origins of English Dramatic Moder Modernism and is the founder and current editor of the ASEBL Journal whose objective is to publish online peer-reviewed papers on the convergence of ethics, evolution, and the arts. Here to discuss his two new books, Art and Adaptability, Consciousness and Cognitive Culture, and Evolution and Human Culture, Texts and Contexts. I'll try to say that really fast. Please welcome Dr. Gregory Tay. So we'd like to thank Dr. Gielen and Dean Lancaster and St. Francis for letting me talk about these publications. Wait, wait a second, you said I'm a professor of English. And this book that I is coming out is called Art and Adaptability? Mm -hmm. And the one before that, Evolution and Human Culture? Wait, I know you. Mm -hmm. My third cousin is here. Mm -hmm. Wait a second, that, that sounds like biology. Mm -hmm. What is he doing? It's, it's a story. When I started out this journey about 15 years, I've been here 20 years, so I started out 15 years ago with the books. And the first one, I was a very good English professor. I wrote a book called Character and Consciousness, and it dealt with English authors from the late Victorian period up to about 1930. That was it. And I said, oh, this is great, I'm done. Uh, I don't know, I wanted to do a little more. And I was very interested in this notion of consciousness and ethical behavior. I said, maybe I should go back. So I went back to the beginning of the 19th century, and I did some things in a book called Ethos and Behavior with Jane Austen up through Henry James. And it was in that book that I started reading a little of neuroscience. I had no idea what I was reading, but I figured, well, maybe I should do it because I'm dealing with consciousness, and I can't use that word and approach it only from a philosophical perspective, which I felt comfortable doing with Schopenhauer and Gadamer. I said, let me look at some neuroscience. And I did that. And I finished that, and I said, oh, that's great, I'm done. I wasn't done. I wasn't done. I said, wait a second. Maybe I can go back a little more. Let me go into the 18th century, because my interest is in the novel. And that's where it begins. And something happened. Because I started reading more and more in the sciences and the social sciences, then the third book, Making Minds, it has 100 pages in there, it's three sections, 100 pages just on science alone, dealing with things like individual, the debate in biology between individual and group selection. 
how is it possible that I could write about that? Well, that, that sent me off on a tangent that led to the last two books, Evolution in Human Culture and Art and Adaptability. The Evolution in Human Culture, I was in a frenzy reading in all these areas, stuff that I probably shouldn't even have been reading in the sciences and social sciences, but I was getting it, I understood it. And what happened with that book, and this may be some good information for prospective authors here, I, you know, I finished The Making Mind. I got up to The Making Mind, the third book. That was the 18th century book that had the 100 pages of science in there. And I was convinced that was the last book. I told my wife, don't worry, I'm not going to drive you crazy. This is it. I'm done. I'm finished. But I started doing all these book reviews. And at some point, I had about 43,000 words of book reviews. And I said, wait a second. There may be another book here. My wife rolled her eyes and said, please, don't do this to me. Don't do this to yourself. But sure enough, that's what happened. And that's where evolution and human culture came out of. And because of my interest in art and aesthetics, then it went one step further. And that's where the art and adaptability came in. And I, I, I just hope that that's, that's it for me. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. But thank you again. This is really wonderful. And the administration has been wonderful to have things like this. We used to have faculty recognition day, so I'm hoping there will be a resurgence in this because all this stuff does ultimately feed back into the students. So thank you. Our uh, last presenter, perhaps, uh, Dr. Horowitz, is not here at the moment. I think she'll be here a little bit later. So we will uh, skip her turn for the moment and go right to uh, our coordinator for today, Dr. Uwe Gielen. Dr. Gielen is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology and Executive Director of the Institute for International and Cross-Cultural Psychology, serving the college for almost 40 years. Having grown up as an internal refugee in West Germany, Dr. Gielen received his PhD in social psychology from Harvard University and then taught at the City University of New York until 1980, when he joined the faculty at St. Francis. Dr. Gielen has lectured in over 30 countries, is a fellow of regional, national, and international academic and professional societies, and in 2005 received the Distinguished International Psychologist Award from the International Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association. Dr. Gielen has produced countless publications and is the author or editor of nearly 30 volumes on a wide variety of topics which range from moral development to international and cross-cultural psychology to Chinese-American immigrants and all the way to the Tibetan culture of Ladakh, India. Here to discuss his newest texts, Women's Evolving Lives, Global and Psychosocial Perspectives, Internationalizing the Teaching of Psychology, and Resources for International Psychology, 75 Years of the International Council of Psychologists. Please welcome Professor Emeritus and organizer of today's event, Dr. Gielen. During the last few decades, I have been heavily involved in international psychology organizations. And in a way, it started when I was 17 because as a high school student, I won, I went to a little school in a small German town. Because of some odd reasons, I won a French scholarship to travel. Mm -hmm. And I uh, decided to go to Istanbul, the most exotic place I could uh, think of in those days. Now you hop into a plane and it's much easier. Right? And from then on, I would sort of uh, quote, run around uh, the most uh, far-fetched places I could think of. For instance, I once hitchhiked through Afghanistan, rather stupid in a way, <laughs> when you still could sort of do it, uh, including bin Laden country. Right? And what I wanted to find out is how societies that are truly different from Western societies, how people think, what they're doing there. Right? Not always attractive societies, they varied a lot, right? but uh, I just was curious. 
Later I got involved in psychology and a bunch of international organizations and I started to edit books on this topic. I decided to co-edit books because psychology now is active in about 150 countries and there's no creature on earth that can be competent in discussing psychology in 150 countries. You can sort of discuss trends, this, that, and the other, but you can't truly understand what's going on. Right? And so there's always a bunch of people, two, three, four, with whom I'm working together, not always the same. And uh, this year, for the first time, uh, there are actually three books that are coming out or have come out. The first one is called Women's Evolving Lives, Global and Psychosocial Perspectives. And that book uh, is edited by four of us, including Carrie Brown, who is actually a Native American, myself, and uh, Judy Koyansky, and who is at Columbia University and is another one of these world travelers and, and also honorary uh, <coughs> professor in China. And uh, finally, Judy Gibbons, who is, uh, now that she's retired, uh, lives mostly in Guatemala where she also sometimes talked. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this book because I thought it's better to discuss one book in detail relatively speaking, rather than go for three minutes through uh, three different books. Uh, one second book, which will come out probably in December, it's called Resources for International Psychology, 75 Years of the International Council of Psychologists. That's a group that I've been involved in for several decades. Interestingly enough, it was founded by women in 1941 in the United States, who sort of felt excluded from the war effort. Right? Later, males were allowed to join, and still later, international people were allowed to join. And uh, off and on, I, I was the president at some point of the bunch, and so on and so on. They had their 75th anniversary meeting just a few months ago at Pace University across the river. Right. And uh, Harold Tukushian, a psychologist at Fordham University, Florence Denmark, a well-known psychologist over at Pace University, and uh, a couple of us uh, will be sort of celebrating the 75th anniversary uh, in a rather unusual way, but again, I sort of thought, let me not discuss this, but come to the third book, which is called Internationalizing the Teaching of Psychology. Came out about six weeks ago, uh, because that's the most detailed book I've been working on for a while. The three editors are Grant Rich, uh, a psychologist out in Alaska, myself, and Hal Tukushin. But altogether, there are 73 contributors from 21 countries all over the world. And let me repeat, why are we doing this? Because we sort of feel if you want to do international psychology better, uh, practice what you preach, right, and get people from various uh, parts of the world. Uh, Dr. Hirsch, who is sitting here from the psychology department at St. Francis, is incidentally one of the contributors as well, uh, discussing health psychology. Now, the purpose of this book is to help those psychology professors who are interested in this to make their offering more cross-cultural and international in nature. And here's the background to this story. In 1980, something like 75 to 80 percent of all academic psychologists were in the U.S. So the U.S. dominated the field. 
recently, uh, Miriam Sommer and I tried to estimate how many psychologists there are and where they're residing. It turns out that now about 22 to 24 percent of all psychologists are residing in the U.S. and a good three quarters are somewhere else. There are more psychologists in Latin America than in the U.S. easily. There are more in Europe than in the U.S. and so on and so on. Yeah. Yet, if you read American textbooks of psychology, you, you could never tell in most cases. Right. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're culture bound. They sort of sell as psychology, but it's really only psychology of people who live in a modern, industrialized, postmodern society. And you don't really understand other people all that well by just reading these books. <laughs> Our handbook, let me repeat, is sort of uh, designed to uh, help those psychologists both Americans and people around the world who teach psychology courses to give a more representative picture of human behavior. And to do so, we have 28 chapters in there, one sort of broadly based introductory chapter, and then all the subsequent chapters focus on one specific area of psychology that tends to be offered in many places around the world. Right? So almost everywhere they're going to teach something about learning, about emotions, about child development, about counseling psychology, and so on and so on. Right? So the subject matters don't differ all that much. Of course, you can't represent all subject matters. The American Psychological Association has 50 four divisions, each focusing on some specific area, and I don't think anybody wants to read a book about 54 areas of psychology. <laughs> so we just picked the ones that we felt were uh, most commonly offered. Right? Now since there's no point in covering 17 different areas, I uh, will focus on one. Uh, namely lifespan psychology, which is offered in just about any country. Uh, not only to psychology students, but also, for instance, to uh, students uh, in education. Well, most education students have had some developmental psychology course. American children make up four percent of the world's children. Ninety-six percent of all the children live somewhere else. For instance, there are 440 million children below the age of 18 living in India. That's more than the population of the United States, 325 million. Right? You could never tell this by looking at those standard developmental textbooks. The Indian children, there are more of them than in the whole Western world. Yeah, maybe one or two examples, that's about it. Right. So, let me uh, discuss just a few topics that I thought might be included in a developmental chapter or text, uh, I should say textbook. Uh, 95% of humanity's history was spent in what people call foraging or hunting and gathering societies. Right? Humans uh, came into this world as a separate species around 200,000 years ago, or uh, something like this in Africa, until 10,000 years ago, everybody on this earth was a hunter-gatherer. Today, these groups are disappearing, but there's still some left in the Congo, for instance, in uh, Central Africa. The 
Cool people, that's how they uh, pronounce uh, themselves in Namibia, Southern Africa, and so on. Right? So, what lives do children live in such hunting gathering societies? And since we just heard something about evolution, that's what we biologically are uh, primed for. We're not primed to live in New York City with 8.4 million people. We're primed to live in little groups. The average hunting gathering band has about 30, 35 <coughs> members. Maybe a dozen children. And that has huge consequences. And uh, one other difference incidentally is that, which is rather sad. Historically, 30 to 50 percent of all children died. And that's true whether you are in the United States in 1600 or you are in various other types of societies. Today, almost no children in the United States die except uh, a few will have accidents and so on, but the uh, death rate is extremely low compared to what happened throughout most of us. So if you're in one of these hunting and gathering societies, right, at least if they are not uh, touched by the outside world, which also includes modern medicine and all sorts of other things, right? the average child will have one or two siblings that die. Right? Most modern children are sort of kept away from that. The second difference is no age segment. If you have 12 children, and that's the whole society, right? it doesn't matter what age a given child is, that child will interact with all the other kids. Right? Uh, our society is completely age segregated. There are studies of fathers, for instance, among the so-called Akka, that show that Akka pygmy fathers interact more with infants and young children than any other group of children that has ever been studied. Right? In fact, if you grew up in this society, you're sort of really growing up in a group. Right? And much of the time, your mother is just one out of several uh, male or female persons. Right? And you may be breastfed by all sorts of other women if they are, you know, obviously in the situation of breastfeeding. That would be totally normal. Why don't you ask your neighbor to breastfeed your child? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, the children are quite creative. They don't have any toys. Uh, many American children have hundreds of toys. It's not unusual anymore. So whatever they play with, they have to create themselves. Right? They have plenty of autonomy. Right? And uh, they learn adult responsibility in the sort of playful way. Right? So they can make up little bows and arrows, especially the boys. And they hunt cockroaches or whatever they can make, uh, hunt. Right? And little by, uh, bit by little, they learn these skills. There is, of course, no state, no police. There is no school. There's no writing system. Right? It's just a totally different world. Uh, a second group of children that are totally different from uh, childhood in New York City are nomadic pastoralists. In other words, people who live in tents, have herds of animals, all sorts of them, goat, sheep, zoo, yaks, depending on where they are, move around. And one group that I'm personally familiar with are Tibetan nomads. When you're a Tibetan nomadic boy around six, you're being sent out to wherever these animals are. Now maybe two or three hundred of them, 
right? And you will be one of the people responsible for these animals. They give you a slingshot. You know, you sort of do like this with a stone. And by the age of 10, these little boys can hit the target at 100 yards. Now, who do they have to hit? Wolves. Eagles. Right? Foxes. Plus their own animals so that they don't stray and uh, become victims to whatever predators are around. Now, if you would send your boy at age six or seven out there to defend your animals against wolves, that boy would be taken away from you in five seconds. That would be child abuse. Right. But that used to be the normal way of growing up for these boys among these Tibetan nomads. Okay, so uh, so clearly these are just two examples, and you know we could go on and on about children's lives that are completely different. I'm going to mention only one more example because it's to me also quite striking. In the year 1800, the average American woman had 7.5 children, and almost. Uh, most likely live in a rural area. Right? When I tell my students, female students, most psychology students are females, you probably know that, right? You want seven and a half children, they look at you like you're crazy. Right? And uh, yet, that was the average number. It so happens that the highest fertility rate right now is in an African country called Niger, 7.6 children, almost exactly the same number as Mrs. Johnson, 1800, in some village wherever in Illinois. Right. So, life for these children, and these are American children, right, was entirely different from life as it is now. Right. For one thing, when you have all these siblings, you, especially if you're a girl, are responsible for bringing up some of these kids. Okay. This sort of modern individualism is unthinkable in this type of environment. It doesn't make any sense. And that is true in many other societies, even today, that are called collectivistic. American society was much more collectivistic in 1800 than it is now. Right? So in an odd way, by looking at these kids somewhere in an African country, you're in some ways closer to what American kids experienced in 1800 then uh, American kids in 1800 are to modern American New York kids, for instance. Right. So it isn't simply, you know, it's all American in these textbooks. It's all modern American. A tiny little excerpt of human history and human society. Right. So the book then, what it tries to do is it tries to Tell the reader, if you teach developmental psychology, here are 20 annotated references that uh, talk about children in other situations and other times, uh, adults in other times, and so on and so on. Right? And uh, it includes movies. Right? Some you can find on YouTube, these little videos, but also longer ones. You know, for instance, the famous series of uh, uh, DVD on preschool in Japan and in the U.S. and in China. Right. And that was done uh, twice, right, within the 25, last 25 years. It's quite interesting to look at the, uh, what it means to go to a Chinese uh, preschool. Here's one image. You see a bunch of these little kids all sitting, it's potty time, they all sit on their potties, mm -hmm. right? 
and whether you uh, are ready or not, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right? Uh, in contrast, Japanese children, and some of the most interesting contrasts are between Japanese and Chinese children, not simply between American and East Asian children, right? are get in certain ways the opportunity to settle their own quarrels. Right. More than American kids and more than Chinese kids. It's rather surprising in a way. Right. And you get a very different form of collectivism. So that's uh, the book that uh, we have been publishing and now we're waiting for the reviews and hopefully uh, there will be a positive. Thank you so much.